Yeah, so you could have a barrel foul out that's got tons of life left into it. It's just fouled out. And, and then, it just needs a good cleaning? Correct, yeah. In context, is only powder fouling that's doing that. I'm not like getting lead smearing on the bore. Right. What is up, everybody? Mark Boardman here. As per, I'd say, nearly usual, my good friend Ryan Muckenhern across from me right now, uh, the topic we're going to tackle today, uh, barrel burnout. Does it exist? Now, Ryan, before we started recording, yeah. well, I think MC Ryan's always recording. Yeah. Um, I yeah, said, is. Is, that, is that a little too much? And no. then what? And what? Like the title? Is that a little too much? Is that a little extreme? What'd you say? I said no. That's clickbait. I was like, that was a, <laughs> that's what I was going for. Yep. Uh, barrel burnout does it exist? I. It's something you hear talked about. Oh yeah. Uh, it's something that you hear like a new cartridge comes out and maybe it's high step and fast. People are like ah barrel, bur- you burn out your barrel. You burn out your barrel. Um, as with as with uh, many things, Ryan, I'd say that depends. Yep. What um. If a person is making that consideration, or let me ask you this question. Do you think people making that consideration are putting an overemphasis on that? It depends. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, great case in point, Weatherby a few years ago released a cartridge called the 65-300 Weatherby. Sure. Uh, so, this is a 300 Weatherby case. So, full-size H&H case, big radius shoulder normally houses something like a 30 caliber, 338 caliber, uh, 375, 416, 458, big stuff. They nicked it down to that itty bitty little 6.5. And uh, we're looking like a you know, 3,600 foot per second potential with like a 127 grain Barnes LRX. It's moving a projectile. Yeah, that's uh, rapido. Moving a projectile. Um, and first thing I saw online is that you've been barrel burner. You're going to burn your barrel out. You're going to get 200 rounds of usable life. Um, and I saw that number vary. I saw that number vary from 200 rounds to 900 rounds or 1,200 rounds, something like that. And, um, you know, I guess in that context, it's a lot of powder, a little, little bitty bore, uh, a lot of, lot of flame jetting, a lot of friction. And, um, you know, barrels are not made out of, uh, you know, a, a completely impervious material. They do have a life. Like, and th- in that, I mean, like, number of rounds that can pass... Down mm-hmm. them before they start to degrade, just like your brake pads do or your piston rings. There, we made it a podcast about cars. Oh, Jim would be so happy. He would. He'd go, he'd go on to, to talking about brake discs and brake pads. We'd never point. get back. Correct. Yeah. Um, but, the, I mean, we're, we're talking about a bearing surface here. So we've got two metals um, moving against each other. We're also, because of that, inducing heat. And then we're adding more heat because we've got that propellant. That's ignited and it's now a, a you know fireball. Yes. So barrel burnout does exist. Okay. H- how it gets there is the subjective part. Okay. Gotcha. We've nailed that down. We've yeah. answered that question. Yeah. Uh, how big a deal is it? Could be a showstopper. Right. Could be something you don't actually. It might be something different than you think it is. Okay. Here's what maybe this is what I was getting at originally. Sometimes I feel that for the intended application of the cartridge, wherein it likely will not see very many rounds downrange. Most hunting rifles. Right. I mean, you're getting, yeah. a, you're getting a good zero, doing some practice, and uh, getting some ballistic data, going to the range, checking your zero, and hunting with it. Yeah. I have a great example. Possibly firing a single shot that season. I've got a great example. Okay. My father, in the year 1984, purchased a Winchester model 670, chambered in 308. Okay. With it, he purchased several boxes of federal 165 grain soft points. Okay. He still has several boxes (laughs) of 165 grain soft points. Because my dad is that kind of guy that if he decides he is going to hunt deer... Um, he's going out and he's shooting it a handful of times, making sure that it's on. And then he might pull the trigger while he's deer hunting. Right. And then the gun goes away. There you go. Back into the safe. And so. Not too much risk of burning out your barrel? A zero chance. No. Um, he, he, he would get five to 20 lifetimes of use out of that, 
out of that barrel. Yeah. Not that that particular cartridge is, um, you know, an aggressive one. Let's say he did have, say, something, what we would... A 6.5-300. You were talking go, about it earlier. Right, a very overboard, conventionally, anyways, cartridge. He'd still never burn that thing down. Right. Yeah. And I think if he shot 100 rounds a year, he'd still never burn it down in his lifetime. Right. So, yeah, I guess that's that's where I was getting at. You know, it, it depends on how you intend to use the rifle, which could also dictate, well, if you do sure. plan on shooting a lot and practicing a lot and maybe you're getting into the long-range stuff yep. and sending a lot of dip rounds down range, don't select a cartridge that's, you know. Sure. Even, even the cadence in which you shoot can, can change this. I was hearing a thing the other day. Guy was saying, uh, it's a different podcast now, I can't recall. I'm not going to be able to give credit where credit is due. But then it's a unique idea unto yourself. Oh, okay. So this is a, a, uniquely original. My thought. Good Correct. to know. Uh, was saying essentially, don't suggested against doing like a five shot group. Said only do three because like on like your fourth and fifth shot, I think particularly your fifth, you are you're degrading that barrel at a rate that's significantly greater than like your first three. Sure, I'd buy that. Um, there's going to be a lot of folks that are going to throw tomatoes at you okay then it wasn't my idea okay um yeah you know and i hear that too and that's somewhat tangential here but a three-round group is fine if that's what the rifle yields like a five-round group is not necessarily better for instance camber mountain Ascent 308 rifle shoots famously for three rounds then it gets hot and then it does very different things yeah a five barrel you know, degrading aside, yeah. you're not getting any valuable information no, from I'm, those last I'm two going, shots. I'm going backwards. And if, if, I'm, if I'm judging a rifle's ability, capability, or merit on how, many, how good it does with five rounds in succession like that, that pencil-thin barrel, uh, I'm writing it off, right? Now, but if you're like a target guy, PRS, long-range sure. competitor, sure. that is a very big deal. Yes, and because... Like on these PRS stages, for instance, um, these shooters are are running rounds rapidly in succession, mm-hmm. oftentimes in much larger strings than five. Right. There should be an expectation that 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 system, you know, optic rifle, barrel, bullet, cartridge, et cetera, performs through the duress of that challenge. Mm-hmm. Just like we would expect a machine gun barrel to maintain its, you know, accuracy integrity over the course of, you know, possibly hundreds of rounds, right? Yeah. It, it has to be appreciably good for that period of time. Yeah. Well, and again, you got to look at the use case. I would say, is it fair to say that oftentimes for those applications sure. where you're shooting, uh, you know, longer strings of fire, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, the cartridge selected is fitting for that. You know, you're not going and doing that with... Cartridge selection and then also the barrel Mm -hmm. itself, right? So what would be different about the barrel? If you have a six, five, 300 Weatherby and you have it in like a Weatherby Mark five ultralight, not likely to be as like stable as Mm -hmm. if you had it in a heavyweight or even a medium weight steel barrel. Right. Right. So I think personally, I'd have different expectations out of those two guns, even in the same chambering, firing the same bullets. Yeah. hundred percent. That ultralight, super thin, tiny profiled barrel, likely to do wild things under the duress of heat compared to even a medium weight barrel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When a, a barrel starts to degrade, mm-hmm. burn out. Sure. What is happening? Sure. So I think we're going to look at this in the context of we're talking actual physical degradation of the material inside of the barrel rather than fouling because these could be very different things different things but interpreted the same way the same way yeah so you could have a barrel foul out that's got tons of life left into it it's just fouled out and, and then it, it just needs a good cleaning correct yeah so like i shoot traditional black powder on occasion <laughs> sure, right? right um i can get good accuracy out of about six balls down the bar and then the wheels fall off, and I am simply fouled out. And that, in, in, in context, is only powder fouling that's doing that. I'm not, like, getting lead smearing on the bore. Right. Um, I'm, I have to scrub and wipe that barrel, and I have to get it 
down and clean again. And then my accuracy returns, right? Uh, back in the day, you, if you guys are listening to this podcast, I've got a revelation. I really love Barnes Bullets. Um, you do? Yeah. So first like, time ever that you've heard true. it on the Vortex Nation podcast. But back in the day, critics of those projectiles talked about their um, copper streaking and their, their fouling issues that they had. And whether that's true or not, I, I think is up to who you ask. But they were a pure copper projectile that had no relief grooves cut into them, the, the original X's. Um, and I've got some of those. To, I've got a box of XLCs. You want to talk about some high-tech whiz-bang bullets is XLCs. Mm. They were coated. Um, oh. So the large bearing surface on that projectile. So a lot of metal-to-metal contact. And nowhere for the softer material, in this case copper, to move to or flow to sure. while it's running down the barrel. So it's either going to streak all the way back to like the heel of the bullet just at the um, junction of, of the boat tail rebate and the um, shank. Mm-hmm. It'll either flow back there or it'll deposit to the bore. Right. And then you have to clean that out um, because now we're, we're actually changing the physical dimension of the bore itself. And then we have a, a likely uneven distribution of material. Right. So you've got a different friction situation at one point in the barrel and a different diameter situation at one point in the barrel that then meets a differential. And then we get wonky accuracy. So there's fouling. That's one thing. Uh, And then there's like throat erosion, fire checking, or look at this as like a physical deterioration of your bore. Right. This is what I consider burnout. That's, and that's, yeah, that's what I wanted to. uh, Yeah. Well, I think this is all actually super interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe a person could think, oh, I shot this barrel out, and maybe all isn't lost, and you probably just need to get the old cleaning kit out. That could very well be. Um, with actual burnout, I guess, in context, what we're talking about is if we look at a two-dimensional cutaway of the chamber, mm-hmm. um, so we're, we're, on, we're on paper here, imagine your cartridge chambered up. You have a, a period or a space between... Um, the bullet shank up to its ogive, a little a little free space there, and mm-hmm. then you have what's called lead, and your lead is going to be a, a taper, an intentional taper, um, where the rifling is cut in such a fashion that it's not a, a, a hard transition from free bore or jump where there's no material touching the barrel to all of a sudden a 90 degree angle where we're running into lands and grooves. Right. Um, and it used to be that there was, and you'd get a lot of fouling, leading, and problems right there. Okay. Um, lead is an intentional chamfer cut into those lands and grooves of the rifling so that we have a transition for the bullet to move into. When this begins to erode and material is literally being torn away, burnished away, uh, or burned or jetted away, that throat will begin to extend. That lead will get further away, and that lead will be less of a, uh, you know, geometrically perfect mm-hmm. you know, and that's what chamfer. people call throaty throat erosion, erosion. Yeah, yeah correct and and that whole part of uh the chamber forward of the cartridge case itself where really the the bullet itself the projectile itself is is stationary and then transitioning into the lands and grooves starts to rip away um, gotcha. for lack of better adjective to describe what's actually happening and that's progressive like it, it starts to sneak forward and it doesn't take a whole heck of a lot and all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, this barrel has problems. Like, once that starts, mm-hmm. I shouldn't say it doesn't take a whole lot, heck of a lot. Like, well, you'll do it in 800 rounds. Maybe. It can take a heck of a lot to get to that point. Yeah. But once you kind of cross that threshold, it's not... Uh, a lot of times, you start to see those problems really kick Yeah. Out. So, long ago, well, actually not that long ago, you, you would hear a term used to called setback so i've got a barrel i've shot it out i set it back what, what are we talking about so you, we have on the table an example of a burnt out barrel this is a tika barrel from one of our range certification guns and i don't even know that it's burnt out we never gave it a chance um you we, just decide <laughs> well we'll get to this one in a little bit so we have our, our threaded shank here uh, where the barrel actually like screws into the receiver and then we would have what's called our shoulder mm-hmm. where the barrel buttresses up against the 
front face of the receiver. Now, not all guns have a, a shoulder barrel. Some use a, like a barrel nut or a collet type barrel nut to okay. control headspace. But this helps us control headspace. We could, depending on the diameter of that shank, cut part of that off, rechamber it, rethread it, reshoulder it, and set the barrel back. Okay. In which case, depending on the severity of that throat erosion and the degradation of the lead and all that stuff that's going on right forward of the bullet, more or less refresh the barrel and refresh the chamber. And then all of a sudden we breathe new life into a gun um, just by setting it back. And not a hell of a lot, too. Like, you know, depending on how much meat you got there, an eighth quarter, mm-hmm. three eighths, a half inch, depending on how much you got there and depending on how severe that erosion is. And that's because at least sometimes... Like you said, you've got that explosion happening. Mm-hmm. Like most of the things that are happening are happening in that throat area where that could be the the part that has become an issue. The rest of the interior of the barrel lands and grooves, good to go for a while. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, fouling aside. Fouling aside. Right. So let's pretend that that barrel has been wiped of all other material deposit. We do that setback. We more or less look at it like a reset and presto. All of a sudden, we've got a ton of usable life out of the barrel, right? Because to your point, we're going to degrade the barrel the most right at that that throat lead area, Mm -hmm. right? The lands and grooves are still being burnished every time a bullet passes down them, and they're still degrading not as severely as they are back here. Gotcha. Just like in your car, to bring it back to a, a car podcast, Inside of your um, cylinder, like at the point of ignition, you would expect more disaster, heat, um, friction inside of the cylinder than you would at the tailpipe. That doesn't mean that the tailpipe's not seeing wear from heat right, and those kinds of things, but far less than we would at the front of the system where the ignition is happening, right? So I mean, I look at it even like, um, you know, you take uh, like a, a movie where there's an explosion, right? Because essentially, I mean, I guess that's what's happening right here. We're having an explosion, Control right? chaos, you bet. Uh, the closer you are to the explosion, uh, the more damage. Uh, yeah. The further away, maybe you get a little warm. Correct. That's yeah. a great way to look at it, Mark. Yeah, I just, you know, I like to equate things back to action movies, right? Sure. Um, I sidetracked myself there. Yeah, thinking about action movies. I did. You know, because we were talking about 80s action movies just yesterday. We were. Yeah. There's some good ones out there. Keep going, because I need to find my thought. Well, I want to talk about, like, expectations versus reality. I like that. Right. And there's a lot of stuff I don't know. I'm not a metallurgist, um, so I can't really speak to the material sciences behind a lot of this and why there's an expectation that a barrel should be burnt out at X rounds, whatever it is, and there's a reality that sometimes defies that. And so... We have on the table here a barrel that we pulled off of a Tika rifle that we use here at the shop for range certifications uh, down on edge. And this barrel, we counted every round that got fired through it when the gun was brand new. So we keep a log for a number of reasons. I want to know the rate of consumption um, that the team is is using ammunition at so that we can replenish it. And I also want to know, like, okay, what should we expect out of service interval for some of these rigs? Mm -hmm. Um, Because we're using them... Uh, for benchmarking a standard of, of uh, you know, accuracy and capability of our optics. So when you send your scope in, if you think you got something wrong with it, we want to make sure that it's A-OK. We'll take it down to the range and shoot it if you like, um, just as a double-double check after it's been through the regular service interval. So I want to know how long we have with a rifle before we need to amend that rifle mm-hmm. um, so that we're not down a period of time or, you know, end up with a situation where we don't have a gun to shoot. Well, then you also don't have a viable testing platform or tool Correct. because if it's, you know, starts to, you don't know what to blame, Correct. I guess. So we have two guns for that reason. Um, identical rifles set up in a fairly identical manner. We actually have more than that. But this in this specific instance, we have two 6.5 Creed Mords that we alternate use with so that we can stretch that program as long as we can without a downtime. So this barrel, um, I, I have to look at the exact round count. I didn't look and peek at the log book. I can tell you it's about 6,600 rounds. That's several to many. Correct. Uh, if I read the internet, uh, they tell me that we should anticipate 
the wheels falling off at at or before 2,000 rounds. A couple things that we don't do with the bores here at Vortex for this program is we don't clean them. We don't run chemical agents down them. We don't scrub them with bronze or plastic brushes. We don't pass anything down them except more bullets. And when this barrel was fresh and new, it shot, it wasn't unusual for the guys to come back after a range certification with groups measuring 0.1, 2, and 3 fairly fairly commonly. Um, when it was at its worst, right before we replaced it, we were getting about a 0.6 to a 0.8 average. Still pretty good. Ah, uh, yes, very good. So we're we're under minute of angle at 100 yards. So on paper, is that barrel burned out? Um, I think just because we put 66 some hundred rounds through it, yeah, it's, it's probably toast, right? We the barrel doesn't owe us anything. It was a valiant run that it had. What we're not seeing, though, because we're not attaching a chronograph to this and we're only working in a space of 100 yards, is we don't know how much variability is actually occurring there that we just can't see yet because we're at a relatively short distance. So I was uh, teaching a reloading class, uh, Introduction to Reloading at Vortex Edge, come and visit us, um, the other day. Very smooth. Uh, Thank you. And The objective of the class is to benchmark with factory ammunition and then beat the factory ammunition in terms of performance. And what we're looking for is shot-to-shot consistency. So we're looking at SDs and ESs on the chronograph, and we want better observed accuracy. And so we benchmark first with the factory ammo, and then we test in iteration our hand loads as we go. And we usually see a pretty predictable thing with this. As we start on the low end of the load, our ESs and SDs are greater. Our case fill volume and and, and low density is not so high. We've got a lot of air gap in between our powder column and our bullet. And we usually observe like a 20-ish SD, which is not great for a precision ammunition application. So you're talking at 20 feet per second, standard deviation between shots. Correct. Yep. Um, Downrange at 100 yards, some of the best groups that I observed in the last class were with the worst SDs. And if we look at it two-dimensionally, we're going to miss something the further out we go. Okay, sure. So we don't see what a 50 foot per second ES gives us at 100 yards. Or I should say we may not see. In this case, in context, because we're using rifles that have fairly stout barrels, they don't show you with like a, a harmonic whip or a reverberation what a differential of 50 feet per second might make mm. because there's... And ES being extreme spread. Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, so we see these little bug hole groups. If we didn't have a chronograph attached to it, we might say, well, that's a good shooting load. We'll go with that one. Yep. And then you go out to four or five, 600 yards and your vertical dispersion of your group goes wild um, because one bullet's going 50 feet per second slower than the other. And a few seconds in a ballistics calculator will show you what that difference will be at 600 yards and you're going to see it as a low high low impact Mm -hmm, on your mm -hmm. target um i think if we were to throw a chronograph so this is my very long roundabout way of getting back to this if we were to have thrown a chronograph onto this barrel at the 6,000 round mark when it was still shooting right around three quarters of a minute of angle i bet our es's and sds would be wild really yeah i i mean almost had to have been the amount of copper fouling and the amount of erosion that is occurring at that number of rounds with the cleaning schedule, which is zero <laughs> that, that we had on these barrels. my kind of cleaning schedule. Right. It, it, I mean the proverbial sewer pipe, when I peek down this thing, there's a lot of crud in there. Um, the gun still shot great at that distance in that two dimensional display of performance that we saw. So, my theory is is if that thing was still viable and attached to a gun and we threw a chronograph on it, instead of getting, you know, what we generally see out of the ammunition that we shoot, which is an SD of between 12 and 18 on average, uh, I bet it's way, way, okay. more, way more. We're just not seeing the negative result, um, so which is why I think it's vitally important to test your ammunition at distances that you plan on shooting. Yes. Um a question that could be asked is, could we have gotten more out of this barrel had we cleaned it? It's a possibility. You know, we've talked about 
cleaning barrels on the podcast, I'm not going to say ad nauseum, but a fair amount, right? And we take a case in point like our good friend Ian, who is one of the world's greatest F-class shooters ever. Mm-hmm. Ian's got a cleaning schedule. Um, and he's he's pretty judicious with that. He's I mean, a regimented gentleman. Yes, correct. Which is why I think he kicks so much butt. Mm-hmm. Um, it's part of his regiment. The most minute details accounted Absolutely. for. for Absolutely. Extreme precision. Correct. Um, could it have extended the barrel life? I think so. Maybe. Depends. Um, could we have ended up in the same result at that same very high round count? I think so. Maybe. Mm-hmm. It depends. Um, I had a, my first test rifle at Vortex predates me by a long time. You were probably there when they brought them in. Oh, yeah. The heavy barrel savages. We had three of them. Yes, we did. One in every car. (laughs) We had green, tan, and gray. Yeah. So, uh. And those guns shot. They shot. They shot. And so I had the, the, uh, gray one. Okay. I have no idea how many rounds went down that pipe before I got there. And then, do we still have those? Somewhere? Yeah, oh, I yeah. Sure hope so. Yep. those are like uh, I mean, those are like historical artifacts. They are. Yep. A lot of catalog photos are done with those. A lot yeah. Of, a lot of uh, industry shoots. So, I first approached Paul Neese and said, "Hey, I need a rifle to go test a gentleman's scope." And he's like, "Oh yeah, well we've got something." And he handed me this rifle and he handed me a case of 168 grain gold medal match. Mm-hmm. And. He handed me that rifle and he handed me that case of ammunition many, many, many times <laughs> until he's finally like, hold on to the rifle, the ammunition's in the back. <laughs> and so we we exhausted a, a large amount of Federal 168 gold medal match mm-hmm. until that actually kind of became hard to get. And then we switched to Hornady 168 and then Hornady 178 grain match loadings and continual replenishments of this ammunition to the point where I have no idea how many rounds I shot through that that gun. And I used to do a lot. I used to do all the range certifications, period. Mm-hmm. And I used to do a lot of them. And it got to the point where, and this is no joke, I noticed something with that rifle. If I would throw a scope on there, get a bore sight, and start shooting, I, usually by the third group, things started to work. Like all of a sudden the gun just snapped into place and came into its own. Okay. So it, it was like a cold start on a on a like an old carbureted vehicle or a diesel vehicle, like a, and then all of a sudden it warmed up and it was like presto. Because I only had the one rifle, but I had a seemingly infinite supply of 308 target ammo, that gun I used to shoot it eight times before I'd put it on on paper. It would be a steel plate hanging. We did the shooting at the outdoor range. Do you think, like now I'm just thinking through our conversation, I'm, I'm hypothesizing yeah, yeah. that, or maybe this is just obvious, uh, but you had some throat erosion. Yeah. And then you were heating the throat up. Material was expanding because of the heat and kind of taking up that gap that had gone away. On top of that, I think uh, what was eroded from the throat was replaced by copper and carbon. Okay. <laughs> And so, no, like, no joke, yeah. eight times that gun would get fired, and then I'd swing it over to paper to the point where in the summer months when I was dealing with so much barrel mirage, I would take with me a bucket, water, and a towel. And when that thing was hot, that wet towel would get laid over the board and knock down that mirage so I could shoot a group. Can I ask a question? Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, it doesn't it's irrelevant right now. Um, why didn't you say, hey we should put a new barrel on this thing or maybe can we get something different? Well, that's a great question. One, because it was kind of a, I'm going rogue with this testing thing. Um, it wasn't an official process at that point in time. Two, what then happened is like, this is ridiculous. Like, I, how can I expect to be consistent with this right. process? So I cleaned the gun and I went in there with an aggressive copper solvent that I use um, very sparingly now um, my previous life used a fair amount of it. And usually this stuff, you, you get down to bare metal in about two hours. Okay. It took a couple of days okay. before that thing started pushing a, a clean patch out. When the copper would dissolve and you push it out, usually our indication of copper deposit is a blue patch. Mm-hmm. The stuff came out like dark purple. 
Okay. And it just kept coming out as dark purple, dark purple, dark purple, and start, slowly started to like lighten in shade until I got to light blue, light blue, and then no blue. And, and I'm not kidding you. It was like I'd start it in the morning. I'd clean it before I came to work. I'd put it aside. I'd come back. I'd start cleaning. And I'm not kidding you. It took like a couple of days <laughs> of this process to get that thing back to bare metal. Quite the project. The gun never shot again. You ruined it. it and I'm telling you, zero appreciable accuracy. I think I, instead of having a 308 Winchester, I think I had a 309 Winchester <laughs> at that point in time. And it, it was unsalvageable. Then we got into a standardized testing platform, um, ordered up two Tikas. Those two Tikas, those barrels toasted. Mm. Ruben's team took them, replaced the barrels on them. I got two more Tikas, and now we've replaced the barrels on them. Yeah. So. Well, and, and you bring up something that I wanted to get to. And I, I for some reason, I just... I, I think some people think about it and then some people don't, but sure. it's like, oh man, you know, if a, if a person is drawn to, you know, just a speed demon, high step in cartridge, maybe they're, you know, doing some, some varminting and want a cartridge of that nature. Or they, they, you know, they just want the most flat shooting son of a gun out there and, and you are shooting it at a volume where you might experience a uh, barrel burnout. You can put a new barrel on it. Yeah. All is not lost. You know, it's not like you throw the, you, you don't have to throw the gun away or it's sure. no good anymore. Sure. Some guns are easier to do that with. Some geographical regions of the planet are easier to do that in. Okay. Um, so, yes, you're correct. Some guns are really easy to rebarrel. These Tikas, Savages, anything that uses call type barrel nut, pretty straightforward. Okay. Right? Break the barrel off, put a new one on. In the case of the Tika, in the case of Savage, detention the barrel nut, unthread it. Thread the new barrel and tension the barrel nut with a headspace gauge. Good to go. Um, that's pretty innocuous. Uh, other guns, other platforms, definite gunsmithing work. Can be done because they got put together once. They can get put together again. Yeah. Yeah. Your rifle smith is the one who's certainly going to make that uh, an easier process for you. Some are certainly easier than others. Um, but you're right. It's it's not like the gun is now a throwaway item, right? A rebarrel or a setback. Can well, let me ask you this. Like, I mean, and I guess in, in some of those, yeah, some are easier, you know, DIY jobs perhaps yep. um, with some know-how. Uh, and then others, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a gunsmith proposition. I guess one thing that I haven't necessarily looked into would be the cost. Of, so maybe the cost is such that you are like, might as well get a new one. I don't know. Sure. Yeah, I think on some older guns um, that have some complex, like, bolt head geometry where – there's like very calculated cuts that have to go in to facilitate a bolt style or an, an extractor style um, or, or a, a barrel profile layout that's not conventional. Yeah, that that you might just be like, well, it was an inexpensive rifle. Like I might be better off picking up a new one unless you're like sentimentally attached to that rifle uh, or for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, certainly some jobs are going to cost a little bit more than others. Um, modern manufacturing is really cool, though. Like I said because they're so consistent that you can buy a prefit barrel for them. Sure. The Savage rifles are fairly universal. You can buy a prefit barrel for them. Um, Remington 700s, people have been doing those for a long time. That's usually not a big job. Um, other guns might be a little bit more effort, depending on the adeptness of the smith who's cutting your, your barrel into place. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. But it is... It does happen. Barrel, barrel burnout does happen. How it happens, I think, can be a couple different ways. You know, like you said, Mark, you, you're shooting a really high step in cartridge. We, we, we're subjecting the bore, the chamber, the lead, the throat to a ton of heat, a ton of pressure, um, a lot of friction. Like I said, bearing surfaces, hardnesses of alloy, like mm-hmm. a differential in there, um, can, can certainly wear things down quicker or slower, depending. Um yeah, so it's real. It happens. But it's not the end of the world. No, no. Um, and like you said, I mean, this is an example of a 6.5 Creed that you guys shot the Dickens out of and ended up replacing. So, so on, on, it's not, you know, limited to, I think, just like those, you know, faster cartridges are. Sure. The more they get, you know, their the finger pointed at them for having that happen. Yeah, and I think that's, I think it's valid. It's valid, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. My expectation out of a, a 300 blackout AR is that I'm going to get, 50 lifetimes worth of firing out of it. I mean, I guess if I was going full auto and I had, you know, just an infinite supply of magazines, 
I'll chew it up. Dare to dream. Right. Compared to like a 223 or just like my 308 Winchester, my expectation is a much longer service interval on that gun than would be my 300 Weatherby. Mm -hmm. So I think of all the guns that I've owned, I've burned one barrel up. It was a 300 Weatherby. And I was shooting 130 grain Barnes bullets at 3,650 feet per second out of it, right? And, and I also fire formed hundreds of pieces of brass prior to loading them with 130 grain Barnes TTSX. I could see where that might have an effect. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So, again, my expectation wasn't um, a 10,000 round barrel life out of that Ferrari of a cartridge. And it shouldn't, it shouldn't be. It's like when we see... Volkswagen diesel vehicles that have 300, 400, 500,000 miles on them and a race car lasts a race, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's how it's used. Yeah. Right? I like it. One thing I would say, I think sometimes people overestimate how many rounds they send down range in a year too. I think a lot of cartridges don't get selected because of those conspiracy theories. And again, if you're like on the fence on this and you want a high-stepping cartridge, you know, that's great. I mean, how much are you going to shoot it? Sure. Right? Good question to ask. So, you know, we've done some work with some pretty high-stepping cartridges, right? 28 Nosler, 27 Nosler. Um, we were shooting 7 Rem Mag and 7 PRC the other day. Mm -hmm. um, these aren't guns that you're going to go out and recreationally bang away with. One, recoil schedule is pretty high. Mm -hmm. Two, cost of ammunition is f fairly ridiculous sometimes. Yeah, yes. I mean... A, a box of 6.5 Creedmoor, the affordable target ammo, goes a lot further than a, a box of, uh, you can almost do like a case of some of that ammunition relative to like sure. a couple of boxes of the other stuff. And well, so, like you said, some more pleasant experience to do that. Oh, with. yeah. Um, no surprise. You know, both physically and financially. But, you know, the 300 Weatherby of mine, I did goofy stuff with it from the get go, and I think that's why I burned it out. I thought I needed to fire form hundreds of pieces of brass so that I had the perfect brass for my 300 Weatherby chamber. Turns out it made no result difference. <laughs> um, had I done that, I, I would have added like 500 rounds of life to it. And I here again, it's a six and three quarter pound rifle generating a, a gobsmack of recoil. I don't shoot the thing a lot. Right. Um, and, and now knowing what I know, here... I'd have a lifetime of use with that gun, even if I hunted elk, mule deer, and pronghorn with it every year. Right. Yeah. Find my load, settle on my load, check my load, validate my data at distance. Life is good. Um, yeah. So I, I wouldn't shy away from high step and magnums uh, if you're looking for a wildly effective hunting cartridge um, for the, the sake that your barrel is going to burn out immediately because it's probably not true. Mm -hmm. Right. Unless you are going to go out and burn cases and cases of ammunition through them, then... Fire forming brass. Yeah. And oh, gosh. The ignorance of youth, Mark. I tell you what, though, Ryan. I mean, you've obviously learned an immense amount along the way, and you just don't learn those things without doing all the things. That's, I learned that you will burn up a lot of powder and a lot of 150-grain FMJs doing that. Yeah. Um, for not <laughs> <laughs> because I still only got three loads per case and then the uh, primer pocket stretched and I could seat my primers with my finger. Oh, no kidding. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So didn't matter what, whether I was doing that or, or shooting the hot stuff. It, I just, I got no more than three loads per case. Interesting. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Barrel Bur burnout. Barrel, barrel burnout. It does exist. Yep. It is a consideration. I mean, it's certainly something uh, to, you know, uh, evaluate when making a cartridge selection for how you intend to use it. Uh, at times, maybe it's uh, overemphasized for how and how much a person may use a certain rifle. And uh, if it does happen to you, there's potential that you could either... Uh, you know, spin a new barrel on or do something else. Can I interject something? Yeah, what? Uh, barrel composition, quality of manufacturing, and bore finish seems to also make a big difference in, in either mitigating or exacerbating the effects. 
Did we just open? Did we just close and then open up a can uh, of worms? Kind of, but through the power of editing, that'll all be moved to the oh, end of okay. the podcast. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure that'll happen. Yep. So, uh, modern barrel production. Yes. While not radically different than the production of your, mm-hmm. has gotten really good. Sure. Budget barrel brands have come up that have turned out outstanding product. Where you know maybe 20 years ago. We'd be like, ooh, that's risky. Uh, seems to me that some barrel manufacturers really have hacked the knack for the production and like the forming of rifling through whatever mechanism they do, button, cut, hammer forge, et cetera. Um, and then the the metallurgy, the stress relieving, the, I mean, every, every process, every bit and piece of the process um, has, has gotten really refined. And I think that can also add to your barrel life sure. or on the inverse if it was haphazard, haphazardly done the bore doesn't have a great finish in the first place um there's a lot of of you know tooling marks inside of the bore if you get like a hawkeye bore scope and you look down like a really budget bore you might see some things that look like a topographical map okay um and on a really good bore it looks just pristine it looks like very finished metal um, applications and coatings on the bore. So I'll, I'll throw one out here from experience, melanite mm-hmm. um, or QPQ process or wh- whatever you want to call black nitride or a similar process to it. Adding usable barrel life, reducing the effects of heat and friction on the bore. Okay. Negative effects. Um, these treatments do seem to make a big difference. Um, and the manufacturing processes that go with them seem to extend barrel life. So, not all barrels are created equal from what I've gathered from personal experience and, and anecdotal evidence from the internets. Um, those that are putting a lot of care into all of the things that go into a barrel from when it's bar stock to when it's ready to be threaded on the gun and then even the, the chambering mm-hmm. uh, can dictate whether you've got a long life barrel or shorter than long life barrel. Some things to look for in mm-hmm. a barrel there. Mm-hmm. 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 I like that. Yeah. But the best part about that is modern manufacturing is pretty fantastic. We've gotten pretty good at things. We have. Very uh, fortunate. Yeah. Yep, we have. And and barrel styles that before were considered meh are seemingly just fine now. I've heard people say that hammer forged barrels are the worst. This barrel's hammer forged. Interesting. These things shoot like the dickens. We've had great success with them. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, there you have it. That's all I've got to say about that. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, yeah, always, I always love chatting about this stuff, right? Yeah. The, the, the uh, nuances of rifles and rifle scopes and all the things that we do with them. It just, it just seems endless, and I, it's just fun. So One more thing. Oh, please. We're going to cut this barrel in half. Okay. And we're going to look at... We're gonna have a look see. Yeah, we're gonna take a peek, take a gander. You're not gonna you can't just do that with your bore scope? I mean you can, but I think it'd be a neat cutaway, you know? We just buzz this off right here and we can get to see how bad that is. I wish I had a fresh one. Oh, to kind of do Compare a side by side. Yeah. It'd be neat to strip all the goo out of it. So we just like bare metal surface. Boy, it'd break my heart to just cut a freshie in half. I know it. I can't bring myself to do it. All right. Okay. All right. Well, there you have it, everybody. Yeah, I think. I, pro- I promise. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for listening. Uh, barrel burnout, like we said, it does exist, but there's some things that you can think about and consider while you're thinking about that. Until next time, happy hunting and shooting. We'll catch you on the next one. See you. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.